Uh, the BioPsych project is combining genome sequence information for thousands of organisms with inferred metabolic pathways for those organisms uh, and with published information from biomedical literature. Uh, their aim is to create a modern, computable fabric for biological knowledge in which uh, information is integrated for a range of use cases. I'm here to speak more about that today. Thank you, Peter. Thanks for inviting me to speak. Well, this diagram is, is your tax dollars at work in, in multiple ways. Um, this is the biochemical network of E. coli, uh, that workhorse laboratory microbe. And you know, hundreds of scientists have spent decades piecing together this collection of biochemical reactions that E. coli uses to convert chemicals in its environment to more of itself. You know, E. coli is this amazing machine that can basically replicate itself. Uh, Silicon Valley has created all sorts of amazing little wondrous machines, but I, I'm not aware of a self-replicating machine that's come out of Silicon Valley yet. Um, in the course of figuring out this network of roughly a thousand different biochemical reactions, each one catalyzed by a protein machine encoded by E. coli's genome, um, biologists have published little bits and pieces of this information across thousands of different publications. And for me, what was exciting about science as a kid was putting all this information to figure out how the actions of all those little parts of this complex machine contributed to the overall function of the machine. But how do you do that if that information is spread across thousands and thousands of publications? So about 20 years ago, we started a project to try to piece together all that information to bring it under one digital hood where we could both make an encyclopedia that was accessible to thousands of scientists online, kind of analogous to Wikipedia, as well as create a computable model of E. coli. Well, we've now done that for, for E. coli, and we're beginning to do it for thousands of other bacteria that have had their genome sequenced. And an, an overview view of my talk is I want to try to pull out a few kind of global themes of our work that, that you may find of interest. Um, just as in Anthony's talk, I liked how he tried to extract lots of lessons for us from, from his work. Um, one, one aspect of our work is that our, our biopsych, so EcoPsych is a, an E. coli database. BioPsych is a collection of now 7,000 different databases. And one, one theme of BioPsych is to integrate diverse data and knowledge for these thousands of genomes in particular, we're integrating both highly curated, high quality information that people are extracting from the scientific literature with computationally generated inferences. Because as we know, it's, it's very slow and expensive to curate information. So where we can't curate it, we have a number of predictive algorithms that predict the information. Another theme is serving a diverse set of use cases that I'll outline shortly from the encyclopedic use case to creating a, an executable model of the E. coli biochemical network. Another theme has been creating extensive domain-specific visualization tools, some of which are based on visualizations that biologists have developed over many decades, others of which we've developed uh, new visualizations. But I, I guess one, one theme I'll argue here is that the the computer science graph hairballs seem kind of ubiquitous across many domains, but in my opinion are only marginally useful. You know, how useful really is it to look at a hairball diagram? So we've, we've tried to come up with graph visualizations that are both domain specific and maybe optimized for certain properties of biological graphs, but also that don't show the entire graph because it's kind of useless to look at the entire graph. I'll also talk about sustainability. Um, our work has been funded by the, the government, by the NIH for many years, um, but the government is showing signs of not wanting to fund database, scientific databases, even though I, in my opinion, um, maintenance of the knowledge they create should be part of their mission. Um, but so we are beginning, we and others are beginning to look at new financial models for sustaining scientific databases. And the one we're looking at and we've just begun to move to is a subscription-based model. So again, I'll use our E. coli database as, as a 
model for what we've done for other, or other organisms as well, what we want to do for other organisms. So we've created this EcoPsych E. coli encyclopedia database. It's an organism-specific database for the best studied organism on Earth, which is E. coli, which was first isolated back in 1885. And our model has been to have PhD biologists read scientific papers, enter their contents into our database, and so far, the information in EcoPsych has been derived from 31,000 uh, 31, publications. One of the things that the curators do is to write little summaries, or what we call mini-reviews, of the functions of different E. coli genes and uh, metabolic pathways. And to date, those, those summaries, if you add them all up, add up to about 2,300 pages of information, as well as literature citations. And we've had a team of programmers over the years who have been authoring web-based query and visualization tools for our website. And we've also been able to derive a, a quantitative metabolic model for E. coli for that biochemical machinery um, that, that's really quite accurate. And one measure of its accuracy is if you remove a gene from E. coli, you can ask, will the E. coli live or not? Because some of the genes have backup systems and others don't. And the model can predict whether the bacterium can live or die with 95% accuracy. Now, in general, this notion of an organism-specific database, also called a model organism database in bioinformatics, um, it, these databases are needed for a number of reasons. You, you probably hear a lot about a lot of headlines about, oh, we've obtained the complete genome for organism X, but actually these complete genomes are really incomplete in a number of respects. Many of the genes have no assigned functions because the computer programs we use to predict gene functions are not very good still. And some of the functions that are predicted are, are incorrect. So over time, we need to um, flesh out that information and correct the incorrect information. We also need continuous updating of these databases to incorporate new experimental findings on the organisms. And one use of these databases is that they become platforms for global analyses of an organism, such as interpreting large-scale data sets, like gene expression data sets, for predicting essential genes, as I just mentioned. Um, one reason you'd like to know which genes, if, if removed from an organism, Will, will kill the organism, is that's, that's how antimicrobial drugs work, is they'll basically knock out a given gene and kill the organism. So when you're designing new drugs, you'd like to know which genes are essential to the organism. And another type of global analysis you can do is to characterize systems properties of the metabolic network and the genetic network of the organism. Um, for example, from a graph theoretic point of view, um, what, what is the connectivity profile of the E. coli metabolic network? Well, our biocyte collection of databases contains 7,600 databases. Um, and each of these pathway genome databases contains information about a range of different data types from metabolic pathways, that is a sequence of biochemical reactions that carries out some small discrete function in the cell. Um, the databases describe individual reactions and their chemical substrates. Databases describe the, the proteins that catalyze these reactions, the genes that code for those proteins, and a lot of the regulatory interactions that turn these genes on and off. And part of what we've done to try to characterize the quality levels of these different databases are to divide them into three different tiers, where the tier one databases are the very highly curated databases. Some of these databases have received person decades worth of curation. Others, just a few months, depending on the, the amount of um, funding that we've had to update the databases. So the Tier 2 databases have been only moderately curated, and the Tier 3 databases have received no curation at all, and that's the largest quantity, Surpri surprise, surprise. Um, these have been purely comput computationally generated from the genome sequence. And it, overall, if you sum up the number of literature references in all our databases, we find that the, the curated information has been extracted from 66,000 publications across this set of databases, with E. coli being the highest uh, by far. And so I mentioned how we combine the curated information with 
computational inferences, we also combine the computational inferences with imported data that we import from other bioinformatics databases for each organism. And so the overall flow of, for generating a new biopsych database is that we obtain the genome sequence from an NIH database called RefSeq. We generate a new pathway genome database. And then we provide this, we, we undertake this whole set of computational inference procedures where we predict the metabolic reactions that the genome is coding for. We predict transport reactions that bring chemicals into the cell. We predict what metabolic pathways are present. We predict um, which genes code for missing steps in those metabolic pathways. We predict organization of genes into regulatory units called operons. We predict uh, also orthologs and PFAM domains. Um, and then we import a variety of data from a number of other different databases, from regulatory information to the, the cellular locations of different proteins. And then that's, after we've done all this automatic stuff, that's where the curation process begins, uh, if we have enough funds to do that curation. So what is curation? Well, in general, it's ongoing manual updating and refinement of one of these databases where we incorporate information from the experimental literature into the database to try to obtain as accurate a picture as we can about the organism. It means authoring these mini reviews about different genes and pathways and citing our sources for all this information, filling out evidence codes that tell us this gene function was determined by experiment, it wasn't predicted computationally. And the curators update many different database fields to store this information. So what are some of the uses that our users put BioPsych to? Well, experimental biologists use it as an encyclopedia to find out what does this gene do in the cell, what does this pathway do in the cell. Um, computational biologists use it to computationally study properties of the E. coli metabolic network and regulatory network. Then bioinformaticists who develop new predictive algorithms use our database as a training set for, develop, for developing machine learning based algorithms that predict new aspects of cell biology from predicting operons or promoters, et cetera. Metabolic engineers use the database as a reference source to design new variants of E. coli that might make biofuels or make new drugs. And educators use it uh, in their classes where they teach microbiology. So I mentioned the different multiple use cases that the BioPsych databases serve, and let me just go through those now. One is that we have a, a web-based interface where users can query genes or pathway information about different organisms, so it's essentially using the database as an encyclopedia. We also have a zoomable metabolic map diagram that's generated directly from the database, so for each organism we can generate an image of its biochemical machinery that's somewhat like a Google map, and we can overlay that map with various types of high throughput data that biologists are now generating, like gene expression data, proteomics data, metabolite data, so that they can essentially see that data in a biological context to see which pathways are turning on and off under a given experimental measurement. Of course, we also provide various query APIs that allow users to compute against the data. And we've also now developed the ability to derive a, a quantitative metabolic model from the database. So essentially, the database is now a storage platform for an executable metabolic model that can make predictions about the cell. And I'll give you more detail on that shortly. So let's look at those perspectives in a bit more detail. So there's the online encyclopedia article. I mentioned these mini review summaries that cover many aspects of gene function. Um, and overall, we have about 2,300 of these textbook equivalent pages of these summaries. So that, that's one perspective. Perspective two is to view these databases as, as queryable databases. We have about 350 different database fields that capture different object properties and relationships. So for example, every different molecular species is a different object in our database. And every molecular interaction where 
two small molecules react to produce another molecule, or one small molecule turns a given gene on or off. Those are all represented as distinct database objects. We have a large number of different search tools and different APIs that can be used to compute across the data. So I've, I've mentioned visualizations. Um, we've developed a number of different kind of genome scale or cellular level visualization of cellular networks. All these visualizations are generated automatically from the database. They all have uh, zoom and query capabilities, and they can all be painted with high throughput data to visualize that data in a biological context. So the simplest one of these diagrams is a pathway diagram. So again, a pathway is simply a set of linked biochemical reactions that start with one input chemical and react it according to a number of different steps and produce some output chemical. And what we're showing here is gene expression levels for this pathway uh, across a, a time course of measurements that a biologist did so that we can now see which steps of the pathway are going up or down uh, during this time course where the cell was exposed to certain different varying conditions. So we can take that up a level by now looking at multiple pathways together. So here we're looking at more of a bird's eye view where we're looking not just at that one pathway, but at four or five connecting pathways that form a larger segment of the cell's overall biochemical machinery. And then if we want to see the entire bi biochemical machinery, we use this version of the diagram, which we can then zoom in on. We have a semantic zooming capability where more and more detail is displayed as we zoom into different regions. We can create actually a wall chart of the biochemical machinery of the organism that's printable. And then this is where we depict high throughput data against this diagram, where we can color the different reaction steps to show uh, how strongly those genes are being expressed by the cell, and then uh, drill down to see detailed expression values for different genes within the pathway. Another diagram we've developed depicts the entire genome of the organism in one screen. So here we're looking at the complete E. coli chromosome, which although it's normally circular, here we've laid it out um, in a linear fashion, uh, actually displayed as you'd read a book. So this is actually a linear, one long strand of DNA where each little triangle here is one gene. So there are about 4,600 genes in E. coli, and they're colored according to this operon or regulatory organization within the cell. But we can also color them according to that same high throughput data set that I showed you before. So here we're looking at the expression levels of, the, of these genes organized by uh, their, their position along the genome. Another diagram we've developed shows the regulatory network of the cell, where here we're showing all the E. coli genes with master regulators in the middle and unregulated genes along the outer ring with various regulatory relationships shown in uh, red. And this is an example of trying to go beyond the hairball where there are many, many, many regulatory interactions known here that if we showed them all, the diagram would be completely inc incomprehensible. So we let the user incrementally explore which relationships they want to see. They can start with a given gene and say, show me everything it regulates, show me everything that those genes regulate, et cetera. OK, let me now talk about this metabolic modeling use case. Um, what metabolic modeling lets us do is to predict what are called the steady state reaction fluxes for the metabolic network. So essentially that means for that big biochemical machinery graph that I showed you before, the idea is for each reaction, we'd like to know when the cell is growing in a given condition, how much flux or how, how quickly is that reaction operating within the cell. And there have been some new modeling techniques developed in the past 10 years or so that very nicely let us make those kinds of predictions given very, very few input parameters about the cell. And these models let us, and, and that was kind of a, an impediment to earlier types of modeling where you'd need thousands of parameters, none of which we could ever measure to do, to do other types of, uh, to implement other modeling approaches. And although these new modeling techniques have their, their limitations, they do let us predict uh, what that set of reaction fluxes is so we can see what's 
what's active to what degree under different conditions. We can predict the growth rate of the cell under different con conditions. We can predict how fast different nutrients will be taken up by the cell. And again, we can do this uh, gene knockout uh, prediction. We can re computationally remove genes and reactions from the model to simulate knocking them out and predict whether the cell lives or dies. Now, one side benefit of, of having these models is that they serve as an important quality check on the data in our database. So we essentially run these models on each new release of the database to check whether they still give the same results, because sometimes in the course of updating the database, we unintentionally introduce problems that make the models not work as well. And this is, this is kind of a schematic view of what these models look like. The models have four main components. The models consist of the list of reactions that I showed you earlier, uh, which are taken directly from the database. There's a list of the input nutrients to the cell, a list of the waste products the cell puts out, and then a list of the biomass metabolites, or a list of all the chemicals that the cell is making from these nutrients that essentially form the building blocks of the cell itself. And for E. coli, interestingly, you give E. coli the right 16 chemicals, and it will live by taking those chemicals in and turning them into 108 different building blocks of itself using 2,200 different reactions. And we can display the overall flux distribution for the cell growing under a, different, a given condition on our metabolic map diagram. And then we can use this, that model to simulate the growth of E. coli under different conditions. So for example, along the x-axis we have time, along the y-axis we have the biomass of E. coli, the amount of E. coli present. And when E. coli is growing anaerobically without oxygen, it grows very slowly. And we can simulate the addition of oxygen, and the cell grows much faster. Then when it uses up its source of glucose, it, uh, the growth stops, and it begins to die off. Now, one of the directions we're moving with modeling next is to look at modeling of a microbial community, such as in our gut microbiome. Uh, the kinds of questions we'd, be able to, we'd like to be able to address with a model of our gut microbiome is, if our microbiome enters an unhealthy state, how do we perturb it back to a healthy state, either by changes in diet or giving the person a probiotic or giving them an antibiotic, perhaps? And so we're beginning to experiment with building models for multiple different bacteria, hooking those models together, letting the bacteria exchange nutrients. There's actually a whole little ecosystem present in our guts where the, the waste products of one bacteria become food for another bacteria. And so uh, this is one of the things we're working on now. And one of the things we're trying to do is to speed up the, the generation of these models, because really the hardest thing is in this process is developing a new working model for a given organism. So we're trying to develop computational tools to help speed that model generation process. So I mentioned sustainability. Um, so our, our website and database files uh, have been free for many years to everyone, but Starting on July 1st, we began a new subscription model that was first pioneered by another database uh, called TEAR, which is a plant database, plant genome database, uh, that lost its funding from the National Science Foundation a couple years ago. And so we're essentially following the model that they've pioneered, where the basic idea is to, just like the New York Times gives you a number of, few ar a number of free article views per month, we're going to give people a number of free page views per month from our site, but once they hit that limit, they'll be asked to sign up for a subscription, and we'll offer personal subscriptions. But at least for TEAR, the majority of their subscriptions are from institutions, from, from companies, and, and mainly from academic libraries. So just as academic libraries subscribe to scientific journals, they'll pay a given journal $2,000 or $5,000 a year so that everyone on campus can access that journal. Uh, that's a, a, a model that university libraries are really familiar with. And so we're using essentially the same model for access to our databases, that uh, university libraries can purchase a subscription, that everyone on campus will be able to access our site based on that subscription. And actually, the price that will be charged will be based on their level of usage from the previous year, which we have web logs for. And so the idea is 
basically for a given year, you're, you're really paying for last year's usage level. And we're hoping that will let us raise funds for curation of additional databases that we have not been funded uh, through the government to, to curate in the past. So let me acknowledge various co-workers at SRI and our funding source at the NIH, and uh, happy to take any questions you might have if there's still time. <laughs>